So now it's time to give uh, uh, the floor to uh, Reverend Dr. Paul Heidestian. Uh, a few words about him to introduce him. It's, it's a great privilege for me, it's an honor. Uh, Reverend Dr. Paul Heidestian is uh, currently president of Haigazian University, Beirut, uh, since 2002. His appointment followed a nine year teaching career at the nearest School of Theology in Beirut, NEST. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology from Haigazian University, a Master of Divinity degree from the NEST, a Master of Theology degree and a PhD degree in Pastoral Theology from the Princeton Theological Seminary, Princeton, New Jersey, United States of America. He, he has many responsibilities and he works in many fields. Uh, also, he teaches lectures and writes in different languages, Armenian, Arabic, English. Uh, among the topics uh, he can speak about it, Middle Eastern Christianity, Armenian identity, ecumenism, youth, education, social issue, peace, pastoral theology. And he's currently the chair of the Central Committee of the Union of Armenian and Evangelical Churches in the Near East. So uh, it's really a pleasure to hear you now for 20 minutes about your topic, foreign missionary activity prior to and during the Armenian genocide. Thank you, Dr. Paul Heidester. Thank you for the introduction uh, as well. Yes, 20 minute challenge, so I think I will go fast. Uh, so bear with me if I go fast here and there, I'll try to slow down uh, in a few places. And I will mostly read my text so that I save time. Whereas American Protestant mission activity in Asia Minor precedes European mission activity, and while its mission activity during the Armenian genocide, that is 1915 to 21, may sound more sensational than the time before, all the way till the burning catastrophe of Smyrna in 1922. Uh, those later years are probably you know, more eventful in many ways, but my presentation today will focus on this activity, missionary activity much earlier than the genocide all the way to that area, proposing that much of the relief and recuperating that took place later on was a natural continuation of 19th century activity. So I'll try to, to make it meaningful for this conference. I'll try to uh, create a, a weave, a, a thread, make a thread between the time of the American board, that is the American missionaries, when they became active, all the way to the British activity or one part of British activity in Turkey and into the Hilfsbund or German Swiss mission therefore showing that even the creation of the ACO is a natural continuation to these prior movements and mission activities mainly, uh, but not exclusively among Armenians. Of course, I'm using the Armenian example story, but there are parallel stories in many other countries, be it uh, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, or, or Greece and uh, Bulgaria and others. So I start with the ABCFM. The American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions is known to be the first major American Christian missionary organization or the more major one to reach Asia Minor and the Near East. Having been formed in 1810 in the state, state of Massachusetts. In the history of our region of the 19th century, it had immeasurable and pioneering impact in religious, educational, social, medical, and cultural development, mainly based on the work of missionaries from Congregational and Presbyterian Reformed churches. The first missionaries arrived among the Armenians, that is, not first to Turkey, but first among the Armenians to work with them in the circles of Constantinople, was 1831 through missionary William Goodell. Uh, great was the impact and very swift uh, as missionary, American missionary activity 
was accompanied in Constantinople with a reform movement in the Armenian or Armenian Apostolic Church, leading eventually to the formal foundation of something called the Armenian Evangelical Church 1846. Now, when this church was created in the first 10 years, 24 churches or congregations were already functioning. In 1873, already 74 churches, 128 Sunday schools, and other examples. Through direct missionary support over the years, 46 secondary schools, among which were 20 for girls alone. Between 1852 and 1915, First World War and genocide, we count at least seven colleges, including Aintab, Harput, Marash, Tarsus, and others. A college for girls in Adana, for example, in 1880. Add to these the founding of a number of theological seminaries in the 19th century, including those, uh, the one in Marash, uh, Marzovan, Harput, and a few others. Dozens of thousands of Armenians, also Greeks, Assyrians, and others, were trained and the linguistic and the cultural impact, not only the religious, was felt and was tremendous. In our short time today, instead of giving many more details, let me summarize the American board input in eight metaphors. A few years ago, when I spoke about a similar topic, I used five metaphors. Today, I'm using eight. Or areas of contribution from the first days of these missionaries in the 19th century, first half into the genocide era. The first one, uh, so I'll mention a number of them. First, the missionaries acted as witnesses. So they were watching, looking, taking notes, thinking, discussing, connecting, but they were witnesses, witnesses of what was happening in the Ottoman Empire in general, but especially within the communities they were serving, mainly Armenians, but also the other minorities around them. They lived with them, they witnessed the good and the bad, the ills and the benefits of their days. In time of famines, oppression, persecution, killing, competition, wars, they shared their witness account in ways that would not have been seen by the external world otherwise. Uh, when I say they were witnesses, they were also witnesses with formal people, media, churches in Europe and America. Next, they acted as relief workers, social workers in days of regular need or in times of wider tragedy. They acted also as unceremonious diplomats. They mediated with the local Ottoman or regional authorities, sometimes to ease pressure on the institution, to get a permit here and there, to intercede, to lobby on behalf of anyone they were serving around them. These missionaries also acted as fundraisers for the schools, seminaries and churches they sponsored or supported. The local congregation, for example, in the USA, often in Europe, was the main area of interest and source of funds. These missionaries also acted as opinion leaders or cultural influencers. They influenced people's taste, perspectives on life and others. Missionaries acted as also examples in institu institutional thinking and institutional operation. To have worked with the new evangelicals to build a culture that focuses on a new mission and a vision, to help write manuals, curricula, constitutions, and focus on reaching out to the individual and not only to the community identity, irrespective of the background. These were some major contributions. They, the missionaries, of course, were finally here also prime actors in spiritual and biblical reform or revival sometimes or mere Christian education. This last point is the most traditional one. And when people thought about missionaries in other uh, contexts, not in the evangelical, they always thought about the evangelization aspect of it but there was so much more such as the metaphors that I used. So a thorough study of their impact will show us the tremendous role 
they played. And it would be simplistic to see such a huge movement of the missionaries in the 19th century uh, with a narrow religious sense only. So that's the American. That was the most foundational one in the 19th century, but then things were building up. I therefore move to Bible lands or the British world. I moved to, the, to Britain and the Turkish Missions Aid Society, or which was later known as Bible Land Society, which was originally founded in 1854. In fact, it is it was a, a mission uh, aid society in Turkey, um, but Britain at the same time also was allying itself with Turkey, uh, which had declared war or there was a declaration of war with Russia, the Crimean War and so on. The story of the British mission, let's say, the Turkish mission in England, later Bible Land, started with an 1853 visit of Cuthbert Young, an English clergyman, evangelist, and his Christian vision. In Constantinople, he had met Cyrus Hamlin, a known missionary, and learned about the good work taking place, publication, translation of biblical materials, printing of Christian materials. He was fascinated by the work of the American missionaries, and he shared this with his British colleagues. So one of the words he said was, he said in England, due to American efforts, the Bible is becoming the great statute book in the East. But since Britain was engaged in war and it had its interest that could jeopardize some mission activity, they thought, the Turkish Missions Aid Society started its mission with an original decision. Rather than sending workers of its own from Britain to Turkey, it raised funds uh, in Britain that would support existing missions, especially the American mission. They even went into another notion called the native agency that was empowering the local Christians to do their work. Interesting to note is that the female education was among the first to receive funding by them. They also provided funds to pay salaries for teachers and pastors of these Protestant schools and, and churches. Scholarships were provided out of England for promoting promising Armenian youths to higher education. They sent them to places such as Scotland, but also in the USA, say Harvard. Another example of British support was that provided to a Baghdasarian couple, for example, I'm using one example, who took care of orphans roaming in the villages as a consequence of a famine that had taken place in 1870s. In 1877, the Christian minorities, especially Armenians, paid a heavy price for the war between Russia and Turkey, and the society realized that it should show more solidarity. Letters from American missionaries sent to Britain described a scene of misery in the Armenian communities as taxes levied on them, forbidding them to carry weapons and being left to the mercy of the neighboring well-armed Kurdish neighbors or Turkish neighbors. So these reports were getting an echo in England. In 1860, there was civil war in Lebanon, Druze Maronite, so it was another occasion to serve Lebanon with 20,000 Christian refugees. A major British, a major factor in British action was a magazine I want to highlight. Uh, initially, it was called the British Missions Intelligencer. Possibly, well, it was in 1882, which soon changed into something called the Star in the East. In fact, today, uh, there's a book, um, early 2000s. It, the book is called The Light Bearers by Gene Hatton. It's the history of this society with so much information that I'm also using. The magazine reports were quite detailed, presented the existential challenges primarily of the Armenian communities in the 19th century. Trouble in Erzurum, for example, was an article of 1888. It suggested that a sustained campaign that was being directed by the Turkish authorities against the Armenians went beyond what was previously committed the paper suggested that the events heralded that, that something worse could be coming. In the early 1890s, the paper reported that heavy taxation on the Armenians was turning the previously wealthy ones into beggars. 
passports were not being issued for the Armenians and other examples. In 1893, the name changed into Bible Lands Missions Aid Society. A few years later, the news about the Armenians was getting worse for them. A missionary from Marash reported in 1895 saying, many fell in our sight like partridges. Another missionary in Aintab said, we have suffered the baptism of fire and now we sit in grief among ruins. This news the, about the new uh, sets of killings shook the members of the society in England and they were calling their offices, asking them, is this really true? Members were worried uh, and they were puzzled why Armenians were to be seen as threatening to the empire. At the same time, they were following the Armenian calls for justice, liberty, uh, resistance, and others. Between 1894 and 96, some 300,000 Armenians were massacred in Erzurum, Bitlis, Harput, Antap, Marash, Caesarea, Marzovan. Uh, the missionaries were in shock. These were the Hamidian uh, massacres. The missionaries were writing all the details, and it is mentioned in the Star in the East. Uh, one person said, where we used to hear hymns. Now we were hearing the roar of the mob and most horrible of it was the loud Zulgat, the wedding cry raised by Turkish women crowned on the roof and cheers on their men who were attacking their neighbors. So in these great massacres called the Hamidia massacres, the star assured the victims that the British society would not leave them alone. Now we need orphanages, they said and the need for orphanages was, was paramount. And, and uh, many of these orphans were not allowed to be adopted by other Christian countries or Christian families in European countries, for example. So the only way was to take care of the orphans within their countries. Now, this, uh, in a way, 18, uh, 1894-96 massacres were kind of a turning point. Uh, and with the Americans leading the work as they were doing the past 60 or 70 years, many new orphanages had to be founded. And many were actually founded in Van, Urfa, Malatya, Marash. And German and Swiss Protestants were quickly establishing their own foundations. At this period, the missionaries reported that there was a growing degree of cooperation and they were happy between the Armenian evangelicals and the apostolics. Now I move then to the German side. Of the main foundations established following massacres of 1894, 1896, and the orphanization, it's my English, orphanization of the thousands was a Swiss German foundation called originally the Deutscher Hilfsbund für Christliche Liebeswerk in Orient or later the Christlicher Hilfsbund im Orient. That will celebrate its 125th anniversary this year. It was established in 1896, two pastors, Lohmann and Lepsius. Significant in this part of mission history is that Germany also firmly stood by the Ottoman government and it, it was part of its propaganda. News of the massacres uh, even produced uh, a convoluted dynamic of denial, sometimes political justification but then that was politics. Uh, but the public domain and the church also were hearing other news. Uh, well, it's sometimes disturbing to read the German ambassador, for example, uh, was expressing his support for Turkey, reassurance to the Sultan uh, in 1888. He said, with us, there is not the least interest in the Armenian circumstances. That's an internal domestic relationship between the Sultan and his subjects. Now, uh, an official with the, within the German Foreign Office commented in 1896 that it could not be the purpose of German politics to look after the Christians of all the world and to organize a European crusade for, uh, for the Crescent, uh, against the Crescent. Still, German and Swiss missionary and humanitarian involvement was against the political tide and courageously so. Some German media outlets, church publications were giving the stories of each town. The level of interest was turning somewhat public. Allgemeine Evang Evangelisch Lutherisch uh, Kirchen Zeitung, the Frankfurter Zeitung, and other papers were telling the stories. From 1896 and on, 
or the era of the genocide, the Hilfsbund mission established or supported maybe 20 orphanages, multiple schools, workshops, tailoring, pottery, weaving, and so on. They cover the wide area uh, in Turkey as well. It was tremendous Christian and humanitarian work. A large number of the orphans they took care of had lost both parents. Of course, at many of the Hilfsbund stations, the work was also done in cooperation with the American missionaries. Now, as a closing, this survey that I tried to do quickly shows us how the missionary ground was providential for the survivors of the previous sufferings and massacres to go through an even more unimaginable genocide during World War I and the already critical role of the missionary institutions and presence on the ground played to reach out to the stricken people. The Armenian communities and individuals faced the genocide with a much better educated, skilled, and resilient way than they would have done without the type of 19th century spiritual, cultural, and organizational enlightenment they had witnessed, at least partly thanks to the missionaries. So when they faced the genocide, the 19th century support was also part of their strength and power. It is also why the missionaries accompanied the Armenians through the genocide and after the genocide into other lands like Syria and Lebanon to help them reestablish themselves and keep up the Christian hope. The ASEO then, for me and after this story, is a natural continuation of the story I just presented, with many missionaries migrating between foundations and institutions supporting each other and continuing or developing the work or picking up the pieces of these minorities after the genocide. Thank you.